the work of photographer Helmut Newton is designed to stop the viewer in their tracks. With female sexuality front and center, the King of Kink redefined what it meant to be a fashion photographer by taking eroticism out of the shadows and into the glossy pages of magazines. Born in 1920 in Berlin to Jewish parents, Helmut Neustädter grew up inundated with Nazi propaganda through the work of artists like Leni Riefenstahl, and it is clear to see how it influenced his concept of beauty. For a boy obsessed with photography, Helmut said it left an indelible impression on him, one that was later tempered by the work of Brassai and Dr. Eric Solomon. He started his journey into photography in 1936 through an apprenticeship with Eva, one of the first fashion photographers in the world, where he worked until he fled Germany in 1938. Helmut ended up in Australia after a short stint in Singapore, where he would meet his wife June, become an Australian citizen, and in 1946 become Helmut Newton. In 1947, he opened his first photo studio in Melbourne, and in his own words, Newton describes his time in Australia saying, They were formative years, but they didn't form me. In 1957, Newton began a 12-month contract at British Vogue, but he quickly realized that this was the wrong publication for his work. His progressive vision was stifled in the conservative atmosphere of British Vogue, so he left for Paris before the end of his contract. In Paris, Newton finally found himself in a world that not only embraced his own stylistic explorations, but reflected the rapidly changing definition of what it means to be a woman. The swinging 60s brought a palpable energy that he was able to capture with his bold, graphic imagery. He rarely shot in studio, saying, A woman does not live in front of white paper. She lives on the street, in a motor car, in a hotel room. 1969 not only ushered in a new decade of technological innovation with the moon landing, it was the year of Woodstock and the bubbling over moment of sexual expression and counterculture. Newton's work in the 1970s combined the glamour of high fashion with an eroticism not before seen in the pages of Vogue. It was more dangerous than the photographs of contemporaries like Richard Avedon, but the contrast is what made his photographs so easily identifiable. Newton said, what I find interesting is working in a society with certain taboos, and fashion photography is all about that kind of society. To have taboos, then to get around them, that is interesting. That's what Helmut Newton did for me. He understood and loved to make fun of those people from where I'm from, the sort of blue blood line of people. That's why I was able to work with him. We were both laughing at me. I was afraid of that side of me. I knew it was strong, and I didn't know how to appropriately use it in real life. This is something that Vogue had never shown before. The woman was always the object of desire, you know. And suddenly you had a woman who was clearly thinking about sex and had <laughs> powerful, lustful thoughts, and it was kind of incredible that that was sort of captured in a picture. I mean, this all sounds so insane to be saying now, but I mean, in the context of what came before, it was really radical. Helmut has great courage with the sort of charm that covers a strong, marvelous interior. He is not afraid to go after the most daring image. And his images, in my opinion, are not daring because they are erotic or for some pornographic, which for me is meaningless. I mean, the real pornography is cruelty and ugliness, and uh, I don't think Helmut is ever involved with that because he's always involved with a certain form of elegance and seduction. And uh, he always, I think, makes women extremely beautiful. He has a cult of the woman. And I don't think even the most curious situation, he never really debases the woman. The woman is always an object of beauty. Gender expression was another boundary that Newton loved to explore in his work. In this photograph, a Wiebeke Knudsen wearing an Yves Saint Laurent tuxedo became a defining piece of iconography in the world of fashion photography. Her stance and her clothing are traditionally masculine, yet she possesses an undeniable feminine sexuality. Helmut Newton delighted in a world of contradictions, shooting for Vogue one day, shooting for Playboy the next, but this photo of Elsa Peretti in a custom-designed Halston Playboy bunny costume brought Playboy to Vogue. Most photographers wouldn't dare to be shooting for what many would consider low-brow magazines, but Newton said, there are two dirty words in photography. One is art, and the other is good taste. Newton's notoriety gave him access to a new type of powerful sitter, the celebrity. When Newton photographed Grace Jones and her boyfriend Dolph Lundgren in the 1980s, he masterfully juggled many controversial themes at once. 
A biracial couple was enough of a scandal on its own, but the undeniable power of Grace Jones and her unwillingness to conform to white beauty standards was even more threatening. I kind of heard around a bit of oh, sexism and racism, and, but I don't, I never felt that at all. I kind of getting into Helmut's head, you know, and it's more of the black and white. It's like he wants me, but I'm not available. Quand on fait une, vous savez, quand on fait une photo avec Helmut, on devient Newton, c'est ça le secret. Oui, on devient comme une chose graphique. C'est pour ça que je reviens toujours à cette idée du dessin de Matisse. Il cherche une forme. Et je crois qu'on ne travaille bien qu'avec lui si on accepte cette idée. Moi, si je fais une photo avec un grand photographe, j'aime que ça ressemble à une photo euh, typique de ce photographe. Moi, je m'en fous que ça soit ressemblant, bien, pas joli, pas joli, laid, moche, fatigué. C'est pas ça qui m'intéresse. Ce qui m'intéresse, c'est la personnalité du photographe à travers cette photo. He would take Polaroids, like 10 Polaroids, before he would bring out this treasure, this magic camera. And, um, and once he got the picture he wanted, he didn't want you to improvise with it. He wanted you to do the same thing about 50 times. And I think it's, it's, in a way, as an actor, I understand that if the form is very limited, you start to really improvise inside it. And I think that's why I found it such a powerful experience emotionally, is that within this form, I got to do whatever I wanted, or I got to feel whatever, or think whatever I wanted. Although Newton quickly became bored of shooting celebrities, there were a few exceptions. When asked by American Photo Magazine, what people do you like to photograph? His answer was, those I love, those I admire, and those I hate. The one woman who really scared him was Margaret Thatcher, who he photographed after she left office. He told The Guardian, I had wanted for years to get Miss Thatcher in front of my camera. As she got more powerful, she got sort of sexier. Another politician Newton photographed was the fascist Jean-Marie Le Pen, who was convicted in France for inciting racial hatred in 1996. Newton defended his decision to photograph Le Pen, saying he considered himself only a witness, not a judge. But the similarity between his portrait and that of Hitler with his German Shepherd was not coincidental. Newton rarely spoke of his childhood in Germany, but his late-in-life friendship with Lenny Riefenstahl shows the complicated relationship he had with his past. You know, Lenny, unfortunately, was a bloody genius. He told his friend and director, Gero van Boom, and as much as he wanted to hate her, he admired her work. You know, I've always wanted to be a fashion photographer. For uh, a reason that I can't really quite work out. But maybe now I can work it out because I like photographing women. So now I'm more aware Look at the women I get to photograph as a fashion photographer. I get the most beautiful, I can choose the most beautiful women in the world. Those girls that photographers like I use are, are very rare. So the chance of being a when you photograph a woman dressed in the most beautiful things that people produce, that great designers produce, the most beautiful jewels that you can put on them, uh, prepared by the most uh, expert uh, hairdressers, the most expert makeup men. I mean, that is really uh, a kind of um, area that is so rarefied for beauty that you could never come to if you were, say, a portrait photographer. If you were a photographer of... Uh, what, what, what women would I photograph? I mean, uh, how would I make my living photographing women? The typical Helmut Newton woman is strong with long legs, blonde with a bold lip, and wields her sexuality as a weapon. Although his photographs were often labeled as misogynist and objectifying women, the Helmut Newton woman was always the one in control. There was never a moment where I felt uncomfortable. It was just an amazing experience where I walked away saying, this man is incredible. Definitely when I look at the pictures, it's, it's definitely not me. So it's his imagination and it's my imagination. I love the fact that I can be this different through his lens and play around in different people, different character roles. I'm not much of a... I think I'm sentimental and not romantic. Or am I romantic and not sentimental? I can get very excited or very sentimental about uh, a train. But I think... Uh, 
First of all, photography, to me, the instrument produces, it's a beautifully, a beautifully machine made uh, instrument, produces extremely sharp pictures. And for me, it is very important that my photographs and the women in these photographs are extremely, ex extremely sharply defined. I think there is nothing natural about my photographs. I think that every one of them is uh, is set up. Nothing is ever. Uh, uh, I never say to girls, "Just walk along there and I'll uh, do anything you want." I never do that. I will to do this, do that, but I don't give her a psychological spiel. You know, I don't say to her, "You imagine yourself to be this femme fatale in this dress," you know, with uh, with your boobs coming out there and all that. Uh, that I never do. There is no psychology. What, what should the hell? She's not interested in that. With Anna Wintour as editor in chief at American Vogue, Newton was encouraged to express his vision in a way that focused more on narrative than clothes. Well, I think it was the work of, of Helmut that gave one the courage, because if you were giving an assignment to Helmut, you obviously weren't going to receive a pretty girl on a lovely beach. That's just not what he was about. I mean, you ask Helmut to take on an assignment the way we would ask, uh, you know, an Irving, Irving Penn for something that was what Phyllis and I call a stopper in the magazine, something that people would remember that was hopefully iconic and maybe sometimes disturbing, but certainly thought provoking. So we, maybe you might consider it brave. I, I personally considered it necessary because I think so much of what we do when we work in fashion is attractive and lovely and what Alex Lieberman would call visions of loveliness. But to contrast with all of that, I think you really do need work that talks about the culture at large and is thought provoking and different and sometimes upsets people. One of his most famous and controversial fashion stories was with German supermodel Nadia Armen, a commentary on the towering heights of heels and the lengths women go to wear them. That year at the collections, there were a vast amount of incredibly high heels that were sort of impossible to walk on. And so we wanted to sort of discuss, you know, how you became disabled by this. They're meant to indicate power and stature and they leave you immobile. It's so graphic. I think, you know, she's so tall and so, so beautiful up there. So framed and the light on the brace. Some people who were disabled found it offensive. But I thought that it actually um, was sort of kind of quite handsome in a way. In his later years, Newton worked extensively with fashion editor Phyllis Posnick, who was also a favorite of Irving Penn. Rather than the multi-page fashion editorials, their work was to create the perfect image to accompany the articles in Vogue. We worked together often, and I knew what he liked, and one of the things he loved was chickens. So when Jeffrey Steingarten was doing an article on fried chicken, I called Helmut and asked him if he would like to do a picture to illustrate it. He paused for about a second and he said, I've always wanted to do a picture of a chicken wearing high heels. So we got the heels from the Doll Museum in Paris and sent them to Monte Carlo. And when I got off the plane, I went to his studio to talk about the shoot. And his assistant was waiting for me to take me up the road to the butcher to try the shoes on the chickens. So we went to the butcher and stood in line, got to the, the guy and gave him the shoes without blinking, without even flinching. He tried the shoes on every chicken in the place. Yes, he did. He did in the wonderful days of, of faxes. And he wrote, Dear Anna, I want to thank you for having the courage to publish my chicken. Most gratifying to me. Look forward to the reader's letters. He loved to hear about the reader's letters. The worse they were, the better. Um, as um, Kaiser Wilhelm II said in 1914, more enemies, more honor, love as ever from your favorite old naughty boy, Helmet.
1998 was the time when women first started to wear athletic shoes with everything. So we did four or five pictures of uh, women in athletic shoes with robots doing things that they shouldn't do. In 2003, Vogue did an article about new cosmetic procedures to make your knees more beautiful if you happen to be obsessed with making your knees more beautiful. And we did a series of pictures of what women do on their knees in Helmet's world. Here, new cosmetic injections streamed every part, streamlined every part of the body, either took it away or added some more, and it was like about as comfortable as being on a bed of nails. So we did this picture, and the minute I talked to Helmut about a bed of nails, he knew exactly where to get one made. In 2004, the 83-year-old photographer was leaving the famed Chateau Marmont and lost control of his car, crashing into a wall and tragically succumbing to his injuries shortly thereafter. His impact on fashion photography is undeniable, placing him as one of the legends in the industry. Helmut was completely aware. He never, he never locked himself away the way some... Uh, famous people do is they, they achieve great recognition. He was always very open to the world. And yes, fashion might have changed and moved on and we, we became aware of a new generation of, of designers. But I feel that because he was such a brilliant photographer and he had such a strong, intelligent point of view with that amazing wit, his pictures remained the same. Not that they were stuck, but the vision remained totally identifiably helmet. The clothes could have changed, the girls changed, but the actual image, you could look at any image and say that's a helmet Newton photograph, and there aren't that many photographers of which you can say that. <laughs>